planet is a never-ending wonder. A million years would barely suffice to see all the sites nature has curated, and it would take another billion to truly comprehend their machinations and ecosystems. So, in our human shackles, we can but watch and try to use our time to admire these gardens of life while we are able to. Today, we will look at one of the most active corners of our globe, the New World, the expanse only recently discovered through the efforts of the Hunter's Guild. This massive continent and its surrounding islands have been the subject of much guild and research activity, and present a perfect place to experience the splendor of our world. This is in no small part due to the staggering diversity of the wildlife. From endemic unicates to familiar faces, the New World is home to over 70 large monsters, all with their own place in the ecosystem. In this documentary film, we will pay each of them a visit, discovering the miraculous and fascinating ways in which they live in this biological paradise. While every single one of them could and probably will fill their very own documentary episode, this film will serve as an extensive overview of all the wonders the new world has to offer. After a long and arduous journey, 40 years after the guild had sent their first and best, the research commission finally eked out a stable and prosperous existence in the new world, functioning as a satellite branch of the Hunter's Guild. Through diligent work, recon, and study, the five fleets of the commission had discovered numerous biomes within the explorable southern peninsula of the new continent. This new home was precious, and immensely fragile, if risked carelessly. It was this prudence that led to the establishment of a mandate that forbid hunters from venturing further north past the Elder's Recess. The underlying logic was that the continent had been observed to become harsher and less hospitable the further north the hunters penetrated, with stronger and deadlier monsters appearing the further north you went. To protect the newly stabilized research commission, the Elder's Recess was deemed the final frontier, with only high rank hunters allowed to venture there in the first place and no one allowed to venture even further. This mandate, however, would not last long, as the New World is a place in constant flux. Massive migrations of Legiana were reported some time after the Elder Crossing investigation, and the patterns of their flight paths, as well as all known behavioral research, suggested that they were en route for another landmass. Crucially, the flight of the Legiana relies on specific air currents that do not occur over vast stretches of open ocean, and thus it was concluded that there must be another yet undiscovered continental shore fairly nearby, another vestige of the New World. Sure enough, as the guild sent out a tentative recon unit across the sea, they made landfall on an icy peninsula that lies west of the New World's first landing separated by a body of water now called the Hinterland Sea, with the newly discovered continental branch being similarly christened as the Hinterlands. However, the excitement of this discovery was tempered by the realization that the conditions and the inhabitants of this new locale were even more dangerous than those found in the Elder's Recess. Due to this, only a single area has so far been mapped within the Hinterlands. The Hoarfrost Reach. This icy tundra, as well as the entirety of the Hinterlands, is forbidden ground to any guild hunter who is not of the exceptional Master Rank qualification. And for good reason, as it represents the harshest environment thus observed on the New Continent. 
its unyielding sub-zero temperatures and jagged icy nightmare scapes are anything but inviting. Within this plane of icy winter, everything moves slowly, deliberately, and with great effort. The frost halts movement at every point of vulnerability and can even freeze time itself for those unfortunate enough to remain within its cold grasp. And yet, beauty persists. Duffel penguins huddle together on the frozen coastlands, while the friendly popo scour the snow-laden forest for surviving grass to graze on. While the white dust dominates the landscape, various hot springs offer relief and warmth to all weary travelers, as well as a nigh-on permanent home to the Pearl Spring macaque. In the south, vegetation yet survives and forms small wintry forests that stretch out over the majority of the southern perimeter. Further north, the temperatures suppress most plants and as such, the landscape becomes more and more frozen. It is here where the most ice-attuned monsters, such as the migratory Legiana, build their nests. Because of this temperature gradient, the guild opted to build their outpost, Celiana, in the south of the hinterlands, allowing for regular visits to the Reach. But even with this ease of access, much of the hinterlands remains unexplored. For example, Vestiges of a complex cave network have been discovered in the area, but they likely represent only a small portion of what truly lies beneath the ice. Similarly, the windswept mountaintops are equally as mysterious, with some being said to hold remains and traces of truly ancient fiends. Very little is known of the exact ecological factors that influence and control the hoarfrost reach, but if one thing has been observed above all, it's locales unyielding inhabitants and their tremendous will to live and to thrive. What should be a wasteland is instead a triumphant symbol of life's never-ending perseverance. While the guild will often speak of discovery and the first landing, it is crucial to understand that hunters are not the first civilized beings to set foot on this new continent. Just how the old world is filled with the traces of cultures long gone, so too is the new world a landscape of memories. The difference, though, is that these memories are not carved in stone, not monuments etched into the horizon, but rather subtle symbols, wooden structures, campfires, and masks. The true originators of the new world are the Gajalaka, wild feline tribes that have made homes for themselves all across the continent. They may seem a tad feral at first glance, but they are unmistakably a culture. They paint, they dance, they practice social, political, and even religious interaction within their tribal communities, and they are everywhere. Including the Hoarfrost Reach, where a unique sister tribe called the Boa Boa were encountered fairly quickly upon arrival. While many feline tribes are understandably distrustful of the guild and will either scornfully ignore or outright attack its representatives in anger, the Boa Boa are more calculative, deliberate, and careful, traits undoubtedly vital to surviving the harsh reach. On numerous occasions, hunters out on the job noted that they were being followed and observed by one or multiple Boa Boa. After particularly impressive hunts, the Boa Boa would even approach the hunter and, with the help of a guild feline translating, invite them to the tribal headquarters. Nestled among the hot springs sits the Boa Boa camp, which has taught us much about how the natives of the New World live and thrive upon it. To thrive in nature, you must respect it and prove yourself to it, so says the Boa Boa chieftain. And indeed, their culture is built around various rituals surrounding your reverence and your worthiness to the land. The Boa Boa as a whole revere, respect, and worship the Popo, whom they hunt ritually, but also whose skin they use for their garments, trying to seem similar to them in an act of respect. One ritual in particular was of interest to the guild, as it led to the discovery and cataloging of the hinterland's first endemic monster. If a juvenile boa boa wishes to become an adult within the tribe, it must gather its friends and hunt the fierce predator of the snowy depths. The Beotodos, 
a Piscean Wyvern. The deep snow of the Southern Reach is this beast's territory, where it moves in the most bizarre way. Like other Piscean Wyverns, its main method of locomotion is swimming, but not through water, not through lava, but through snow and frost. Thanks to its sleek body and the massive, sharp horn on its head, the Beotodos can use its fins to propel and to quite literally cut through the frozen ground at significant speeds, making it one of the fastest creatures thus found in the Horfrost Reach. This speed serves its highly effective predation, as few victims can effectively defend themselves against a fast menace approaching them from the very ground beneath their feet. The horn does not just serve movement, but also combat, as it can easily impale any prey or adversary. Its sloping curve can also be used as a shovel, allowing the Beotodos to launch snow at its target. While the purpose behind this behavior is still subject of debate, one hypothesis is that it is an attempt to blind the target and to lower their body temperature, frost-related deterioration of bodily functions. It has other uses for snow though, and luckily for the researchers, more obvious ones. Many Piscean Wyverns employ environmental armor layering, a process by which a material from their immediate surroundings is attached to the skin to serve as protection. Mud and magma are well known examples of this, and the Beotodos adds snow to that list, covering itself periodically to cushion any lucky blows. As the low temperatures make vegetation and thus herbivores fairly scarce even in the more temperate south of the region, all predators must be exceptionally successful and aggressive to survive. The Beotodos fits the bill perfectly, as it will relentlessly attack and at least attempt to eat anything it finds trespassing through its hunting grounds. Fast, evasive and deadly, this creature is truly fearsome and is thus revered by the Boa Boa as an ideal of strength among the frost. This is why the adolescence ritual of the tribe demands the successful hunt of a Beotodos, preferably an older, stronger individual. This ritual isn't reserved for felines though. The Boa Boa have allowed and even welcomed hunters to participate, a great step in crafting good relations with the natives. Curiously, the celebratory hall in which these rituals are begun and concluded is adorned by a massive Beotodos skull that is many times larger than that of any existing Beotodos. Whether this implies an ancient ancestor, a gigantic subspecies, or maybe just the remains of one particularly large individual is so far unknown. While the Boa Boa are happy to hunt Popo and to test themselves against the Beotodos, they are also realistic about their modest size. While taking down the smaller inhabitants of the Southern Reach is doable with enough help and vigor, the entire tribe together would stand no chance against the true behemoths of the area. Their thundering footsteps reverberate even across the snowy fields, as their massive crowns are visible from far away. The Banbarrow These enormous brute wyvern patrol the entire Horfrost Reach, but are predominantly observed in the south. While their size and enormous horns make them look fierce, the Banbarrow is actually a fairly relaxed herbivore, grazing on any plant matter it can find and ignoring most minor annoyances. It is primarily concerned with moving and maintaining its massive size. Both its tail and its horns serve as counterweights that allow the beast to delicately balance itself and move much more gracefully than its mass would suggest. A far bigger problem is to keep a body this size fed. The Horfrost Reach is already sparse in resources, and so a monster as large as the Bambaro must adapt. As much as it looks like it thrives in the cold and in the cold only, with its heavy woolly coat, the Bambaro is actually nomadic and will routinely leave the Reach to scour food elsewhere. But even if enough plant matter is found and ingested, the Bambaro runs into yet another hurdle. While it itself is herbivorous, its ancestry were carnivores, and thus the Bambaro's stomach is not yet completely adapted to consuming plant matter efficiently, making digestion long and difficult. But this problem too, the Bambaro has solved. After collecting and ingesting enough plants, the Bambaro will return to the Horfrost Reach and drink from the hot springs. 
The water in these natural hot oases are rich in microorganisms that gather in the heat. And it is these microorganisms the Bambaro takes into itself to cultivate a bacterial colony within its gut that allows for more efficient breakdown of plant cells. Not unlike the bacterial zoo found in a human intestine that allows us to eat vegetables. These ecological pressures do however also temper the Bambaro's seemingly relaxed demeanor. While they are decidedly less aggressive than other brute wyvern, they are far from entirely docile. As distant cousins of the Kestodon, they share their conditional fury, wherein they will retaliate relentlessly if provoked enough. Those horns are not just for show after all. A direct collision with them can pulverize any opponent. Due to their size, the horns can also be scraped across the ground and collect an avalanche of debris, rock, trees, etc., which can be then crashed into the target. When enraged, the Bambaro even inflates a tertiary horn on its snout, which serves as both intimidation and stabilization for the debris its main horns catch. Curiously, it has been suggested that this growth might serve as a replacement for the brute wyvern's characteristically stubby arms, as it can serve as a shovel and even hold things by wedging them between itself and the beast's head. But it isn't just entirely new species that were found in the hinterlands. As they are part of the new continent, which sees many regular migrations, it was only a matter of time until familiar faces with a new look were found. When a species suddenly finds itself in a new environment, due to migration, ecological changes, catastrophes, etc., it faces a slew of new challenges that force it to either adapt or die. Rather, in short, natural selection kicks in. If a species manages to, over time, exhibit the right genetic traits and build a stable population in a new environment, it can become a new branch of that species. In other words, a subspecies. The drastically different conditions in the Horfrost Reach compared to the rest of the New World made the discovery of some type of subspecies a fairly reasonable expectation. The guild would however have to search quite thoroughly before they finally found it. A subspecies of the ancient forest Tobikadachi, named the Viper Tobikadachi. This orange fanged wyvern was difficult to discover due to its highly unusual lifestyle. The forest species prowls the greenery openly, gliding between trees and pouncing at prey in broad daylight. The viper kadachi, however, is much more elusive, as it is rarely seen among the snow. Instead, it almost entirely lives within the subterranean cave network that penetrates much of the reach. This confused guild researchers for a long time. Why would a Tobikadachi, whose body plan was suited to wide range mobility, choose to only inhabit narrow and dark caves? The answer came in a second observation. The Viper Kadachi doesn't just inhabit any cave, instead specifically choosing caverns that sit around or on top of thermal vents air ducts that blow hot air from inside the planet's crust upwards. These vents can significantly heat up the surrounding area, thus making these caves a lot warmer than the outside. Thus, it was discovered that the Viper Kadachi is actually not at all adapted to living in the cold, and is instead hyper-specialized in living in these heated cave structures. It lives in the Horfrost Reach, but it has no cold resistance, and yet, it thrives. Against all odds, successful natural selection. Nonetheless, this lack of cold resistance influences the Viper Kadachi's entire life. It cannot spend too much time on the surface, but it has to emerge in order to hunt. Thus, its body has evolved to maximize the speed and success of its hunts. Gone is the thunder sack of the forest species, replaced with two new organs a poison sac in its abdomen, and a paraplegia sac in its jaw. The poison sac douses the tail feathers in noxious toxins, which enter the target through mere skin contact. The tail itself also now has specialized muscles that allow for some feathers to be detached and launched, poison included. 
The paraplegia sac, meanwhile, imbues the Viper Kodachi saliva with a paralytic agent, which will stun any bitten victim instantly. Both of these new abilities serve the same purpose. Get the prey back into the warm cave as quickly as possible. By paralyzing them, the Viper Kadachi stops the victim from struggling, and thus wastes no time dragging them back into its lair, and the poison also saves on time that would otherwise be spent on killing the prey, as it now happens during the paralysis and while the Kadachi is currently dragging the prey downtown. Once underground, the Kadachi will find the warmest spot and eat, allowing the heat to speed up its digestion. This lifestyle has also altered its musculature. Due to the strain of having to heave prey back home, the wyvern's legs are much more powerful now, allowing the viper kadachi to jump high enough to initiate gliding without the need for trees like the forest species does. Not all familiar faces had to change so drastically, however. The migration of the Legiana was the inciting incident that led to the discovery of the hinterlands, and so, their presence in the Reach was an expected and yet exciting topic of research. While the Legiana is an isotuned flying wyvern, what could it be doing this far from its natural habitat, the Coral Highlands? Upon arrival, it was discovered that the northern part of the Reach essentially serves as a giant Legiana nursery. During their breeding season, enormous flocks of Legiana migrate here to mate and nest, spending a few months in these massive colonies before returning back to the Coral Highlands, where they live the rest of the year. What governs this rhythm and why the nesting grounds are so far from their usual habitat is not yet understood. But in the meantime, research has focused on another factor of these colonies. Among the swarms of nesting Legiana, a slightly different group of flying wyvern dwells, similar but not identical. The Shrieking Legiana is, in terms of body shape and overall look, very similar to the regular individuals, being slightly larger and sporting an overall darker skin tone. This is however not a subspecies, but a variant. Born as a normal Legiana, but then changed within its lifetime due to non-genetic factors. What these factors are exactly is unknown, but the Shrieking Legiana's behavior gives researchers a clue. While the regular Legiana come and go in migratory rhythms, the Shrieking Legiana stay within these nesting colonies all year round, guarding and protecting the hatchlings as well as coordinating the entire colony. This observation has led to the theory that Shrieking Legiana function as wardens and guardians to the Legiana nesting grounds, wherein, by some unknown factor, a few young Legiana develop differently from the regular ones, maybe through hormonal changes, and take up the role of the Shrieker. Due to this role, the Shrieking Legiana exhibits the authority of an Alpha, able to call and direct the regular Legiana through its signature screams. As a guardian, these variants also have to be more powerful and better adapted to the Horfrost Reach than the regular individuals, since the Shriekers stay in the cold their entire life and must fight off any intruder no matter how powerful. In service of this, the Shrieking Legiana has further developed the ice sack the base species is known for. While a normal Legiana can produce ice droplets which can be swiped into icy winds, the Shrieking Legiana has far superior control over this icy liquid. It can grow them into sharp icicles and even have the ground covered in them. This frozen liquid is also much colder and much more aggressive than before, making it easy to incapacitate opponents quickly. The Shrieking Legiana's increased mass also allows it to use more brutal attacks from the air to leave any trespasser running for their life. Some trespassers might be too strong for that still. The Horfrost Reach is a deadly environment, and a predator truly adapted to it is not unlike an unstoppable reaper. This also applies to branches of species not usually found in the cold. While the Viper Tobikadachi avoided the cold and thus never became a true force, that is not the case for the Fulgur Anjanath a brute wyvern which faces the icy tundra head-on. 
While the regular Anjanath was already a fierce troublemaker, it pales in comparison to its blue and orange subspecies. With increased muscle mass, a thick feathery coat and even more aggressive temperament, the Fulgur Anjanath is a far deadlier predator. Instead of the somewhat passive territorialism of the regular species, the Fulgur Anjanath will actively travel outside of its normal range and even into other locales to satiate its hunger. It will also attack pretty much anything that comes into view and is therefore much more dangerous. The key way the Fulgur Anjanath differs from the Forest Anjanath, besides the coloration, is its use of element. While in the forest, the Anjanath relied on spewing fire, the Fulgur species opted to evolve thunder-based abilities. Instead of the usual fire sack, the Fulgur Anjanath possesses a modified thunder sack, specifically built to convert kinetic energy derived from physical motion into electric charges, very similar to the organs found in the old words Astalos. Thus, by moving around, running, leaping, stomping, the beast gradually builds up electricity within its body. This charge is directed into the Anjanath's back sails, where it is stored as it pulses up and down the membranes. This behavior has been cited as corroborative of the Thunder trade-off hypothesis. In order to prevent the risk of the electric charge negatively interacting with the nerve system, it is stored in an external organ and only allowed into the main body during the exact moments it is necessary. These moments come once the charge reaches a certain power. The Anjanath can then infuse its signature mucus with high voltage charges, which can be used to electrocute prey both up close and from afar through spitting it. It employs a fairly sophisticated strategy with this as well, being able to selectively electrify spots on the ground with its mucus in order to entrap its prey. Should an attacker come too close, the Fulgur Anjanath can even bite into the ground itself and send an electric charge through it that causes a small electric explosion. Should all else fail, it can use up its entire charge to coat the majority of its body in a thunder aura for a few moments, usually using that time to crash head first into its enemy to cause a deadly, thunderous collision. Equipped with these abilities, the Fulgur Anjanath is not to be taken lightly, and it does not take its own position in the Horfrost Reach lightly either. While the Fulgur Anjanath is undoubtedly a fearsome predator, it cannot allow itself to be reckless, as an even greater threat prowls the reach. Subspecies and variants, these new emerging forces may be well adapted to the tundra, but more often than not, it is the ancient masters whose methods truly shine. And in the Horfrost Reach, one such master, a creature well known in the old world, dwells and reigns almost unchallenged. The Berioth. Having been observed by the guild for multiple generations, the Berioth is considered maybe the most well-adapted species when it comes to cold environments. Its white coat turns it nigh on invisible among the snow, and thanks to its naturally squinted but sharp eyes, it can see clearly even when the ice is reflecting the sun blindingly. But most striking are, without a doubt, the wyvern's massive tusks. These two orange teeth are extremely sharp and can slice through muscle and bone with almost no effort at all. They are deadly weapons that the Berioth employs ruthlessly, but they are made deadly by the Berioth's second defining feature, its speed. The Berioth is a flying wyvern, specifically of the Foot Wyvern group, like the Tigrex and Nagakuga. This group is defined by the odd trait of having mostly lost the ability to fly for extended periods of time, with both the Tigrex and the Nagakuga only flying fairly rarely. The Berioth, meanwhile, forms the exception, a Foot Wyvern which has not only entirely regained flight, but also mastered it beyond many other flying wyverns. It can leap into the air effortlessly and glide at ferocious speeds, 
or it can choose to hover and spit the freezing liquid from its frost sack from its airborne position. But even when grounded, the Berioth is faster than one might think. The slippery ice of its habitat makes movement uncertain and slow, but thanks to the numerous rows of spikes and claws on the arms and legs, the Berioth can easily maneuver on frozen ground and maintain its speed effortlessly, as the spikes dig into the ice and give the beast stability and grip. Losing too many of these spikes, however, does mean becoming a victim to the ice's slippery properties. Should a Berioth feel too threatened though, it can always choose to keep enemies away by spewing its frozen liquid either at them or at the snow, where the impact and temperature gradient can cause short-lived icy wind spirals. In the old world, Berioth populations were mostly kept in check by the presence of other apex predators and the abundant influence of the hunter's guild. This generally led to them living lives that were believed to be well under their maximum life expectancy. Partially, this was intended. The guild was highly concerned of the possibility of aged, experienced Berioths becoming a problem, as they were already plenty dangerous as juveniles. In the new world, the influence of the guild is much lessened, and the Horfrost Reach only has few monsters that can pose a serious threat to a mature Berioth. Thus, the Berioth of the Hinterlands can actually reach old age, at which point they are changed so drastically that the guild classifies them as variants, with their own unique name. Frostfang Berioth. The name is derived from the dark hue of its tusks, discolored by decades of contact with the freezing sub-zero breath. Frostfang Berioths are generally larger and have longer, shaggier fur, but beyond looks, they are much more proficient in their use of that sub-zero breath, by necessity. With advanced age, the Berioths' muscles and bones deteriorate, and it loses some of its signature speed. To make up for it, they become increasingly more sophisticated in their use of their sub-zero breath, until they truly master it. A Frostfang Berioth has total control of this icy mist, allowing it to lay traps that freeze prey to the ground. It even coats its white fur in a thin layer of frost regularly to increase durability and also make skin contact with the beast immediately detrimental. Thanks to these adaptations, the Frostfang Berioth can keep fighting right up until the sun sets on its life. The wintry desert of the Horfrost Reach encourages many such stories. It is a place where time feels frozen, and yet for monsters of all shapes and sizes, it is a place at the end of time, where the mundane and the mediocre are stripped away and only the extreme remains. Many species may wander in here, but few truly survive, unless they fundamentally change. This next monster is not a resident, not a consistent population, but nonetheless an often observed inhabitant who thrives here at the end of all things. It isn't unusual to find a Rajang in the icy wastelands of our planet, they roam remote, desolate regions and often migrate multiple times throughout their lives. The Warfrost Reach is no exception. However, it is also here where the Rajang's true power has been witnessed in the New World. Generally, a Rajang's Thunder Mode can be forcefully turned off by damaging its tail enough, since that sends a reflex through the spine and closes the membranes that allow the Thunder Element to circulate. Some rare Rajang individuals, however, have been observed to have lost their tail entirely, only possessing a hairy stump. In these cases, the affected Rajang remains permanently in its thunder mode, making it significantly more dangerous and more aggressive than the normal individuals. This is classified as a variant, called a Furious Rajang. While it is assumed that the tail loss causes this change, there is actually some debate over it, as some recent researchers insist that actually, a furious Rajang develops through different unknown factors and rips off its own tail in a sort of ritual. 
Either way, furious Rajang are tailless Rajang through which lightning courses continually. And the name, Furious, denotes its immense aggression as it spends all of its time in combat. Due to its attunement to the Thunder Mode, it has gained much greater control over the element. It can send it through its fingers and into the ground, launch thunderballs with delayed explosions, or simply imbue its fists with it. And just like the regular Rajang, it can also force the electrical stimulation to inflate and overcharge its muscles, allowing for enormous strength. The furious Rajang also exhibits significant control over its joints, cracking them at will to release tension and prepare them for impact before big attacks. It can even enter a further rage state in which the thunder aura envelops it further and enhances its strength even beyond. This is a risky move however, as it takes active concentration to keep up, meaning that losing this mode is as easy as receiving head trauma. Due to its enormous aggression, the Furious Rajang is a lonesome traveler, only really interacting with the world around it when it is trying to kill it. But nonetheless, it has adapted, it has survived. And so, it represents one of the most unstoppable forces not just on the hinterlands, not just on the new continent, but in the known world. The frozen expanse of the hinterlands is a desolate place, where life must compete and continue against all odds. A kingdom of strife and frost. But every kingdom needs a queen. And just like all the other locales of the New World, the Horfrost Reach is also the territory of a resident elder dragon, whose steps scare away any but the fiercest beasts, whose breath mingles with the icy wind itself, and whose wings glide above the snow-white fields of misery. The Velkana was long believed to be a myth, as its description sounds truly fantastical. An elegant dragon made of glass, whose breath is as cold as a dead star. And yet, it exists, here in the Reach, where it reigns supreme. Its glassy body is covered in iridescent scales which allow the Velcana to endure frightening cold effortlessly by ways of countercurrent heat exchange. Its hook-like claws allow for a strong grip on even the iciest of planes, and its massive wings allow for swift and elegant flight. Between its regular protective scales, however, sit a few uniquely colored blue scales, which feed into its signature ability. The Velcana's total, complete control over ice. Within its body, it holds a frigoform sack, which can produce super-cooled water. This water can either be funneled to the mouth for supercooled beams, or be directly expelled through the skin. In the latter case, the Velcana will use its blue scales to manipulate the shape of the ice into a protective armor, which serves both for protection and for intimidation. The Velcana is generally uninterested in fighting, as it rarely feels threatened. Should an attacker push their luck, however, they will be met with the true wrath of the Iceborn Wyvern. Its claws are too precious for movement, so the Velcana does not use them for combat. Instead, it relies on its spear-like tail to brutally impale its enemies. Simultaneously, it begins spreading supercooled mist for various purposes. Beams, ice spires, icicles that appear out of thin air, the Velcana has many ways of killing its target, but more crucially, it is immensely strategic. Some moves it will only use conditionally if the target is at a right spot, and it will prepare the ground with ice pools in order to get the most out of its ability. Its control of ice goes so far that it can even make prosthetics for lost limbs should an attacker have success in cutting off, for example, the tail tip. The plains the Vilcana wanders will become battlefields, rooms of icy death that no one can escape from. Winds howl across the white desert, a signal of desolation and strife. 
If warmth and energy are both the precursors and the denoters of life, then the cold is the antithesis of it. It enters every pore, slashes at every inch of exposed skin, exploits every weakness. And yet, despite it all, the Hoarfrost Reach is home. It is home to a vast variety of creatures that cannot and will not give in to the elements. Life is unbothered by the challenges of the Reach because to live is to be free, to define one's destiny and to pursue an existence wherever one may find oneself. Even at the end of all time, at the end of all things. Thank you all so much for watching, and a huge thank you to all of our patrons, including Karthair, Fiction Ape, Mr. Game, Sini, Courage, Alex, Eric Nelson, Iron Camel, Jameson Tate, Jostua, Ludenther, Paracha, Peroscoco, Project Iceman, that's just Ash, Wisdom Manari, Mr. Meander, and Geo. I'll see you all next time, and I hope you have a wonderful couple of weeks because, oh boy, I need to get back to work.